Welcome to the NASA Manned Space Flight Center. Please make a directory selection. make a selection. Welcome to the NASA Manned Space... Hi, I'm Al Harris, Flight Director for the Apollo Space Program. This is Jim Waters, Launch Director at the Kennedy Space Center. For the next few minutes, Jim is going to give you an overview on how the Apollo hardware and software systems work. Thanks, Al. Today we are standing in Mission Control, which is the heart of the Operations Center. If you would like a guided tour of this historic room, press Mission Control Tour when the main directory appears. For mission operations, command and lunar module flight systems, history, and lunar flight profile, press the appropriate button in the Johnson Space Center directory. Please make a selection. Communications between mission control and Apollo space vehicles are vital for total mission success. It is important that you listen to all air-to-ground radio traffic. Now, this is hard to do at first, so if a message is missed, ask Mission Control to repeat the transmission or check the update button in the CSM2 display. The Saturn V rocket, the Command Service Propulsion System, and the Lunar Module Ascent and Descent stages all utilize gimbal-controlled engines. It is imperative for the pilot to understand gimbal angles and engine control surfaces. During basic flight and course correction, engine alignment must be calculated and the appropriate X and Y coordinates must be entered into the navigational computers. An X coordinate is a left to right engine bell movement or angle. A Y coordinate is an up and down engine bell movement or angle. It is imperative that you, the pilot, copy and enter the accurate gimbal angles for proper trajectory. Mission Control will calculate and then radio to you all gimbal angles to adjust gimbal angles. The pilot must switch the data radar display on the CSM panel 2 to input, or if operating in the lunar module, LM panel 3 to input. Type in the gimbal angle coordinates, then select Enter and Set Gimbal. After receiving gimbal angles and coordinates from Mission Control, the pilot must set the engine thrust percentage and burn duration in the Guidance and Navigational Control System. From this point, the onboard computer system keeps track of the spacecraft's location and trajectory during all maneuvers and engine firing. The most important aspect of any lunar mission is communicating with mission control. Unfortunately, due to great distances, solar interference, and poor transmission quality, it is sometimes difficult to understand mission control. The first aspect of radio communications is tuning the primary and secondary frequencies. Most of the time, mission control resides on the primary frequency. During pre-launch, the ground controllers reside on the secondary channel. During lunar orbit, the command module will also be on the secondary frequency. It is imperative that the crew listens carefully to mission control and follows all orders during the flight. The pilot must also speak clearly into the microphone when transmitting with mission control. If good radio habits are established, most problems can be eliminated during the mission. Sir Isaac Newton was an English mathematician and physicist who could visualize the motion of objects in space. Newton's first law of motion is a body continues at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by some external force. In other words, if you fire the main SPS engine for a brief period of time, the command module will continue flying through space forever unless it falls into a planet or the sun's gravity field or you fire the engine again in another direction. Keep in mind that you don't have a tremendous amount of fuel. Don't waste it. 
The reaction control system, or RCS, fuel, is easy to misuse. Don't try to over control the spacecraft. Short, RCS firing bursts are all that are necessary to correct spacecraft trajectories. Previous landing sites. The Apollo 11 landing site at Mare Tranquilitatis was located at 0 0.7 degrees north, 23.4 degrees east. The landing occurred on July 20th, 1969 at 5.17 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lunar liftoff occurred July 21st, 1969 at 2.54 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The time on the lunar surface was 21 hours 36 minutes. The EVA duration was 2 hours 31 minutes. 21 kilograms of lunar samples were collected. The Apollo 12 landing site at Oceanus Procellarum was located at 3.2 degrees south, 23.4 degrees west. The landing occurred on November 19, 1969 at 1.54 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lunar liftoff occurred November 20, 1969 at 9.25 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The time on the lunar surface was 31 hours, 31 minutes. The total duration of both EVAs was 7 hours, 45 minutes. 34.3 kilograms of lunar samples were collected. The Apollo 14 landing site at Fra Mauro was located at 3.6 degrees south, 17.5 degrees west. The landing occurred on February 5, 1971 at 4.18 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lunar liftoff occurred February 6, 1971 at 1.48 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The time on the lunar surface was 33 hours, 30 minutes. The total duration of both EVAs was 9 hours, 22 minutes. 42.8 kilograms of lunar samples were collected. The Apollo 15 landing site at Hadley Apennin was located at 26.1 degrees north, 3.7 degrees east. The landing occurred on July 30, 1971 at 5.16 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lunar liftoff occurred August 2, 1971 at 1.11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The time on the lunar surface was 66 hours, 54 minutes. The total duration of all four EVAs was 19 hours, 7 minutes. 76.7 kilograms kilograms of lunar samples were collected. The Apollo 16 landing site at Descartes was located at 9 degrees south, 15.5 degrees east. The landing occurred on April 20, 1972 at 9.23 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lunar liftoff occurred April 23, 1972 at 8.25 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The time on the lunar surface was 71 hours, 2 minutes. The total duration of all three EVAs was 20 hours, 14 minutes. 94.3 kilograms of lunar samples were collected. The Apollo 17 landing site at Taurus Littrow was located at 20.2 degrees north, 30.8 degrees east. The landing occurred on December 11, 1972 at 2.54 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lunar liftoff occurred December 14, 1972 at 5.54 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The time on the lunar surface was 74 hours, 59 minutes. The total duration of all three EVAs was 22 hours, 3 minutes, 110.4 kilograms of lunar samples were collected. Proposed Landing Sites Apollo 18's proposed landing site is Taurus Litro, which was also the landing site of Apollo 17. This landing area is a flat floored valley some 7 kilometers wide, bounded on three sides by high mountain massifs, with the valley containing numerous craters of volcanic origin. For Apollo 19, the proposed landing site is the crater Tycho. This deep crater is located in a mountainous region near the Longo Mountains. This area is extremely difficult to reach and will require an experienced pilot.
Clavius is the proposed landing site for the Apollo 20 mission. This site will require extraordinary amounts of fuel due to its extreme southern latitude. The proposed landing site for the Apollo 21 mission is Copernicus Peak. One of the most dangerous landing sites due to the mountainous region, pilots must fly over Copernicus Peak and land in a 12,000 foot deep valley. Archimedes is the proposed landing site of the Apollo 22 mission. This site is located in the Pallas Puteridinus region. This rugged crater offers few landing sites due to its pockmarked features. Apollo 23 will attempt to land at the Cleomedes site, an extremely challenging and mountainous area. Pilots must fly over a 16,000 foot mountain and land in a deep crater area. Patavius is the proposed landing site for the Apollo 24 mission. Located on the top of a rugged plateau, Patavius has several small mountain ranges surrounding it. There are only two landing sites available for this difficult mission. Lunar Craters Plato. Located on the dividing mountain range between Mare Ibrium and Mare Fragoris, Plato is moderate in elevation but large in size. Aristoteles. This crater is located in the north central region of the Moon in the Mare Fragoris. Atlas. Located in the northeast region of the Moon, Atlas and its twin crater Hercules are both rugged and deep. Aristarchus, one of the regions originally considered for exploration by an unmanned lunar traversing vehicle. Cleomedes, this gigantic crater is located north of the Mare Crisium area. Eratosthenes, located in the Sinus Astium, this is a deep and forbidding crater. Copernicus, this huge and rugged crater is located just south of the Mount Capathus region, was to have been the landing site of Apollo 18. Julius Caesar, located between Mare Tranquillitatis and Mare Vaporum, this crater is located in a mountainous region. Langrinus, located east of Mare Facundatatis in the eastern central part of the moon, this large crater is next to a tall mountainous region. Ptolemytus, a very distinct, deep and rounded crater, located just below the equator in the center of the moon. Alba Tigenius, located in the mountainous region just below the equator in the center of the moon. Patavius, this crater sits on top of a large mountain range south of the West Humboldt region. Tycho, a very large crater, very difficult to reach, but in many ways was scientifically attractive, was to have been the landing site of Apollo 20. Clavius, located at the bottom of the moon, this crater has several mountainous peaks surrounding it and has a rugged basin. Selecting a spot where a lunar module can land is a complex exercise requiring trade-offs among dozens of factors. Predominant among these are the topography and texture of the lunar surface and the requirements of the lunar module's guidance and navigation system. Other restrictions include the elevation of the sun at the landing site, the temperature of the lunar surface, the radiation environment in space and on the moon, and the Earth lighting conditions desired for launch and recovery. Spaceflight is incredibly dangerous. Both spacecraft have redundant systems. All of the primary systems have caution and warning indicators. When a problem arises, troubleshooting these systems is a necessary procedure during the mission. Mission Control is constantly monitoring all spacecraft systems and will instruct the pilot as to proper repair or reconfiguration of defective systems and hardware. However, there will be periods of loss of signal known as LOS in which the crew must solve its own problems. During periods of LOS, a system that has failed should be shut down and emergency backup systems put in place. Understanding the spacecraft and its systems is vital to a pilot's successful completion of a mission. Consult the flight plan for system diagrams, emergency procedures, and system descriptions.
To arm the RCS for spacecraft control involves a four-step process. Step one is arming the joystick controller. Step two is arming the quad port or left side RCS jets. Step three is arming the quad starboard or right side RCS jets. Step four is arming the quad forward and reverse RCS jets. If you find that the spacecraft is out of control due to over RCS compensation, use the Stabilization and Control System, or SCS, as a last ditch effort to gain control of the vehicle. Don't be afraid to abort an event if you suspect that a system is not aligned or operating properly. You should constantly monitor all flight systems for possible malfunctions. Remember, that this Apollo hardware is the most advanced and complicated system we've ever built for space. Treat it with respect and you will have a safe and successful mission. Each spacecraft has its own horizon indicator. By depressing the red button on the indicator panel, the pilot may view yaw, pitch, and roll attitudes. This is necessary so that the pilot may see a graphic orientation of the spacecraft. Please make a selection. The Saturn V rocket was developed by the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. It is made up of six sections and is the most powerful rocket ever flown by man. The first stage is known as the S-1C. It has five engines, is 138 feet high, 33 feet in diameter, and weighs 5,022,674 pounds when fueled. The stage is the first to ignite at liftoff. The second stage is known as the S-2. It has five engines, is 81 feet high, 33 feet in diameter, and weighs 1,059,171 pounds when fueled. This stage supplies over one million pounds of thrust. It ignites after the first stage burns out and jettisons. The third stage is known as the S-4B. It has one large engine and is 58 feet high, 21 feet in diameter, and weighs 260,523 pounds when fueled. This stage carries the lunar module and boosts the crew into a lunar trajectory. This stage ignites after the second stage burns out and jettisons. The command module and service propulsion system are two separate systems. The command module is the central command point for the lunar mission and houses a crew of three. The service propulsion system supplies the command module with life support systems and is the only engine the spacecraft uses. The command module is the primary control center for the mission. It consists of a forward compartment with two small reaction control engines, the crew compartment containing crew accommodations, controls, and displays, and the aft compartment housing 10 reaction control systems and storage tanks. The lunar module is the final section of the Saturn V rocket system and supporting hardware. It is a separate spacecraft which carries a two-man crew to the lunar surface and returns them to lunar orbit and the command module. The lunar module, also referred to as the LEM, is a two-stage vehicle designed for space operations near and on the moon. The LEM is incapable of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. The LEM is 22 feet tall, 33 feet wide, and weighs just under 40,000 pounds when fully loaded. The ascent stage has five substructural areas. The crew compartment, the midsection, aft equipment bay, thrust chamber, and oxygen support and miscellaneous fuel tanks. The descent stage is divided into three areas. The first is the descent engine compartment. The second is the center area, which houses propellant, water, helium, and RCS fuel tanks. And the third is the landing gear and the porch and ladder system. The service module and service propulsion system is divided into six sections. Four sections contain the service propulsion fuel system. The fifth houses electrical producing fuel cells, 
cryogenic, and oxygen tanks. The final section houses electronics and miscellaneous subsystems. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Email communication with Mission Control can be accomplished by clicking on the AOS indicator located on panel CSM3 or LM3. This is usually done after Mission Control has asked you to respond or has called you. Listening to radio traffic is important during pre-launch activities as well as the entire mission. Once a response has been requested, simply check on the AOS indicator and a typing box area will appear. Simply type in your response and click on the AOS indicator a second time. Your message is instantly sent via S-Band Radio to Houston and the Mission Control flight team. The following is a list of responses typically requested by Mission Control during the mission. Email is available on both the standard Apollo mission simulation and the deluxe edition. Check the flight plan overview voice response section for a detailed vocabulary list. Please make a selection. Command mod. Launch escape system. This button controls the launch escape rockets which are used to jettison the command service module from the Saturn V rocket during an aborted launch. Ascent track. The ascent track indicator is located below the velocity display screen. When activated, this indicator gives the pilot a detailed view of the vehicle launch window which includes not to exceed limits and warnings. There are three panels in the command module. All three panels are marked in the lower left side of the display. The CSM-1 panel, fuel status, is for all of the Saturn V's engines as well as the command module's service propulsion engine and the reaction control jets. Also featured on CSM-1 is the main computer display giving status on all aspects of the CSM flight dynamics. Another monitoring device is the velocity display. This video screen indicates proper flight trajectory during ascent and descent events. Located in the top right area of CSM-1 is the horizon indicator, commonly referred to as the eight ball. By pushing the small red button, you can see a 360 degree view of the command module in relationship to the moon, earth, and the lunar module. Finally, we have the engine command and engine status controls. Both systems help the pilot make critical engine adjustments. Command Module Panel CSM2. Please make a selection. To exit, press CSM1 or CSM3. Warning. Safety release open. Pyro Arm. This button arms explosive charges, which are employed to open parachutes, jettison the S-4B stage, service propulsion system, and the lunar module. This system must be turned on before jettison can occur. Update. This button updates the computer monitor by clearing the display screen of all data. CSM-2 is located in the center instrumentation panel. This panel is the heart of the CSM system. Located in the center of CSM-2 is the primary data display monitor. All of the ship's functions appear in this display, 
which includes computer status, radar, service propulsion, system data, guidance navigation data, and environmental control. Also located on CSM2 is the status display area. These buttons control all of the vital equipment located on the command service module. These systems include computers, the inertial measuring unit, gimbal control, and autopilot. The third control area on CSM2 is the command module button group. These controls have serious consequences and inadvertent use can cause premature termination of the mission or even death. This group has a safety cover which shields the pyro arm, LEM jettison, and SPS jettison. Also located in this group are the parachute deploy controls, lunar module docking controls, and post-landing safety features. The fourth area is the flight systems group, which includes activation of the radio, environmental control, command module system test, and an emergency backup battery. And finally, the CSM panel has the master caution warning system. Located in this area are the primary warning indicators for all basic systems in the command and service propulsion systems. Command Module Panel CSM3. Please make a selection. To exit, press CSM1 or CSM2. Signal Indicator. This indicator tells the crew whether they have acquisition or loss of signal with mission control. Command Service Module Panel 3 is the engineering control center for the CSM. The CSM-3 panel is divided into four groups. The first is a continuation of the master caution and warning system focused on the cryogenic and electrical production systems. The second button group is the Service Propulsion System Command Service Module Status Display. Located in this group are all primary engineering controls. The third area is the electrical status indicators. These gauges display analog values for all primary engineering systems. The fourth and final area is the communications system. Primary and secondary radios enable the flight crew to communicate with mission control and the lunar module. Also located in this area is the acquisition or loss of signal indicator. This button allows the crew to see their communication status at a quick glance. The command module electrical system is divided between fuel cells and batteries. There are three fuel cells on board the CSM. The primary source of electrical power is the fuel cells. Each cell consists of hydrogen and oxygen compartments, as well as two electrodes. The cryogenic gas storage system supplies the hydrogen and oxygen used in the fuel cell power plants. Three silver zinc oxide storage batteries supplement power to the command module during flight, re-entry, and landing. These batteries are recharged from excess power generated from the fuel cells. This is required during peak periods of power demand. One other silver zinc oxide battery, independent of and completely isolated from the rest of the DC power system, is used for emergency situations and for explosive devices such as parachute deployment and separation. The electrical distribution system distributes power through a four-bus system. The main bus is a central electrical conduit through which all primary voltage travels. The A, B, and C buses are routable electrical conduits which can be used to reroute power during emergency situations. Fuel cell 1 recharges the A battery through the A bus electrical subsystem. Fuel cell 2 recharges the B battery through the B bus electrical subsystem and fuel cell 3 recharges the C battery through the C bus electrical subsystem. During emergency situations, the bus tie line circuit allows the crew to reroute power to necessary systems that have been damaged or voltage starved. Please make a selection. Lunar Module Panel LM1. Please make a selection. To exit, press LM2 or LM3. Contact Light. This indicator allows the crew to see 
when the lunar module contact probes located on the descent stage make contact with the lunar surface. The Lunar Module Panel 1 is divided into five areas and includes a viewing window. The first area is the primary caution and warning system. This gives a pilot a cursory look at all systems during peak flight periods. The second area is the Lunar Module Fuel Status Display. These gauges display all fuel quantities on board the Lunar Module. Also, the panel has an 8-ball, or horizontal indicator, identical to the Command Module. Like the command module, the lunar module's computer display area is identical, giving elapsed time of the mission, yaw, pitch, and roll rates, and other flight data. The engine command group allows the pilot to control all engine firing commands. Other areas on this panel include the abort arm control, lunar surface contact indicator, and thrust percentage. Lunar Module Panel LM2. Please make a selection. To exit, press LM1 or LM3. High Band. This button activates the high band display, allowing the pilot to view a wide range radar signal. Low Band. This button activates the narrow field radar system, amplifying the radar image for close up viewing. External camera. This button, when depressed, allows the crew to view external camera feeds supplied by the launch pad or onboard camera systems. The Lunar Module Control Panel number two also has a viewing window and four primary indicator groups. The first is the caution and warning system with a master alarm. The second group is the cryogenics display gauges, which include oxygen, helium, and engine oxidizer. The third area is the lunar module status display. This button group controls the environmental control system, the inertial measuring unit, fuel pumps, and tanks, engine gimbal, and joystick control. The fourth and final area is the radar display. Controls located in this panel are high band, giving the pilot wide radar picture, and low band, which gives the pilot a close-up radar view. Lunar Module Panel LM3. Please make a selection. To exit, press LM1 or LM2. Target Update. This button displays previous mission control messages and uplinked data. Computer Status. This button allows the crew to monitor the total primary and backup computer systems. Input. This button allows the pilot to input gimbal rates, guidance, and navigation data into the Lunar Module primary computer. Lunar Module Signal Indicator. AOS, Acquisition of Signal. LOS, Loss of Signal. This indicator informs the crew whether they're in radio range of the Earth. Similar to the command service module, the LM3 panel houses all of the engineering controls and gauges for the lunar module. It is divided into five areas. The first is the primary systems button group. This area controls all vital systems, including autopilot, reaction control, oxygen, and primary guidance and navigation. The second button group is electrical distribution. This includes battery control, main and engine breakers, tank stir, and all electrical busing. The third area is the electrical status gauge group. This includes an analog display of the batteries, bolts, and DC current. The fourth area is the communication system, which is identical to the command module system. It allows the pilot to tune preset radio frequencies. The final area and control group is the trajectory display. This section gives the flight crew a graphic description of the landing terrain which they are entering. Also located in this display is the gimbal input system and the computer system display. The Lunar Module Direct Current Electrical System consists of three silver-zinc primary batteries 
and one silver zinc backup battery. Power feeders from all primary batteries pass through circuit breakers to energize the lunar module's three DC buses. AC power is supplied by two inverters located in the ascent stage. During emergency situations, the LEM bus tie line circuit allows the crew to reroute power to necessary systems that have been damaged or voltage starved. Please make a selection. Launch. The Saturn V rocket is launched from the Kennedy Space Center in an easterly direction. During liftoff, the vehicle experiences maximum dynamic pressure, which is called Mode 1 Bravo. The first stage, S1C, is jettisoned by the pilot at T plus 1 minute 45 seconds. The second stage is ignited seconds later, and it propels the rocket into the atmosphere. The second stage is manually jettisoned at approximately T plus 3 minutes 5 seconds, at which time the third stage ignites, which is the S4B. The stage propels the launch vehicle into low Earth orbit, tower jet. At this point during the launch, the pilot jettisons the launch escape system. If a failure were to occur after this point, a nominal abort and return to Earth can be achieved. Orbit and translunar insertion. After two orbits and properly configuring the spacecraft, the crew was given permission to fire the S-4B one final time. This burn will catapult the launch vehicle out of Earth orbit. After S-4B shutdown and escaping Earth's orbit, the crew manually jettisons the final stage of the Saturn V rocket. During this maneuver, the pilot must turn the command module 180 degrees and dock with the lunar module. This maneuver is time and fuel critical and must be performed with delicate accuracy. After successful lunar module docking, the combined spacecraft fly to the moon at 8,000 miles an hour. At this point in the mission, the first service propulsion system engine burn occurs, adjusting the lunar trajectory. As the combined spacecraft approach lunar orbit, a second SPS firing must occur which fine-tunes the CSM trajectory. Lunar orbit insertion burn is the final step which places the combined spacecraft into lunar orbit. This burn is time critical. If not accomplished, the moon's gravity will cause the spacecraft to do free return to Earth. The pilot must position the service propulsion system so that its engine will slow the spacecraft, causing it to fall into lunar orbit. The ideal lunar orbit for the spacecraft is 60 by 100 nautical miles. This affords the lunar module proper altitude for its lunar landing. The six-step landing procedure begins with the command module lunar module separation burn maneuver, LM descent. Step number two, the lunar module fires its main descent engine, which starts the lunar landing maneuver. Power descent insertion is a braking maneuver, which slows the lunar module, causing it to slip from orbit. The lunar module engine is at high thrust. This braking maneuver is critical. It must greatly reduce the spacecraft's descent for proper lunar landing. During this maneuver, engine thrust is adjusted to slow the lunar module to a descent rate of 20 to 40 feet per second. This is the first opportunity the pilot has to survey his or her landing site. This is usually done at the 500 foot to 1000 foot altitude. Final landing approach adjustments are also made during this period. A gentle landing on the lunar surface requires 2 to 7 feet per second descent rate. After accomplishing this, the pilot must disarm and safe all systems, including the descent engine. After proper spacecraft ascent configuration and permission from mission control, the ascent engine burns, thrusting the crew off of the lunar surface. Moments after engine ignition, the computer guides the lunar module into a pitch over and locate ascent phase. Liftoff velocity will climb to 6,000 feet per second. During this portion of the ascent engine burn, lunar gravity becomes less apparent on the spacecraft as it moves towards lunar orbit. After the high gate phase is completed, which designates the end of vertical rise, the orbit insertion phase takes place, culminating with ascent engine burnout. 
After a scent engine burnout, the lunar module is now in low lunar orbit, coasting toward a rendezvous with the command module. CSM LM Doc. During the lunar module coast phase, the command module fires its SPS engine, adjusting for rendezvous with the lunar module. Step number two, the lunar module uses its remaining RCS propellant to gently dock with the command module. Trans-Earth Injection. After transferring the crew and gear, the lunar module is jettisoned. The service propulsion engine is fired once again, placing the spacecraft into a return trajectory to Earth. After Trans-Earth Injection is completed, a third course correction burn will be required for fine-tuning the return flight. Fourth Course Correction. This fourth and final correction is known as a corridor correction burn. Properly done, this burn prevents the spacecraft from skipping off into space or from entering the Earth's atmosphere at too steep an angle. This burn is critical for the safe return of the spacecraft to Earth. The command module begins to enter the Earth's atmosphere at approximately 400,000 feet altitude. At this point, the crew enters the radio blackout LOS period. At this point during re-entry, the astronauts experience 6.35 Gs. The spacecraft is now approximately 1,000 miles from the recovery site. At approximately 600 miles from the recovery site, the spacecraft exits the radio blackout phase. The spacecraft is maneuvered into its second peak, and the crew experiences nearly 6 Gs. At a 50,000-foot mark, the crew deploys the three main parachutes. These three chutes gently land the command module at the recovery site and concludes the mission with a safe return home. Please make a selection. The flight director is responsible for every aspect of the mission. Once the Saturn V rocket clears the tower at Launch Complex 39, the flight director here in Houston, Texas, is in charge of the complete mission. I'm standing at the booster officer's console. The booster systems engineer is responsible for all of the engines on all three stages of the Apollo Saturn V. From this console, he can monitor every element of the huge Saturn rocket. This includes the first stage, S1C, that has five huge F1 engines. The second stage, S2, has five J2 engines. And the third stage, S4B, has one J2 engine. The retro fire officer, or retro, is the individual responsible for keeping continuous track of abort and return to Earth options in the unlikely event that a problem occurs during the mission. This is the Flight Dynamics Officer, or FIDO, console. This person is in charge of monitoring trajectories and planning major spacecraft maneuvers such as mid-course corrections, lunar orbit insertions, and trans-Earth injection engine burns. This person is also in charge of both spacecraft propulsion systems. I'm sitting at the console where the guidance officer, or GUIDO, works. This person is responsible for both the command and lunar module's onboard computers and the lunar module abort guidance system. This is the flight surgeon's console. From here, NASA doctors keep an eye on you, the pilot, and monitor your physical condition during stressful missions. I'm sitting in the capsule communicator's chair, commonly referred to as CAPCOM. Now this person is responsible for relaying up to the flight crew by radio all of the flight director's instructions. This is the procedures console. The person who sits here is responsible for keeping the team working together in an integrated way.
This is the Department of Defense, or DOD, console. During activity on the lunar surface and also during onboard experiments, a military officer monitors scientific activities. Please make a selection. All astronauts must complete five flight simulator tests before they are assigned a mission. The first flight simulator test is the launch simulator. The astronaut trainee is given permission to enter the command module simulator only after the written test has been passed. The second flight simulator test is the re-entry simulator. After the first written test has been passed and the first flight simulator launch has been passed, the trainee is granted permission to enter the CSM re-entry simulator. The third flight simulator is the Lunar Module Docking Simulator. After the second written test has been successfully completed and the trainee has satisfactorily completed both launch and re-entry simulators, the astronaut trainee is granted permission to enter the docking simulator. Upon successful completion of all three written tests and the first three simulators, the astronaut trainee is granted permission to enter the Lunar Module Landing Simulator. After successful completion of the LM landing simulator, the astronaut trainee is granted permission to enter the Lunar Module Lunar Liftoff Simulator. Only after completion of all written tests and the five Apollo flight simulators will the astronaut be given his or her flight wings and assigned an Apollo mission. Please make a selection. All astronauts must complete three 20-question tests before they are approved for Apollo flight status and assigned a mission. Astronaut testing is divided into three separate written tests. The first written test is the rookie level. This test gives the trainee a basic understanding of manned spaceflight history and Apollo flight hardware systems. The second written test is the pilot level. This test is designed to teach the trainee in more detail all aspects concerning Apollo flight procedures and spacecraft hardware. The third test, commander level, will finish the trainee's basic instruction. Completion of all three tests, as well as the three JSC flight simulators, is the final step before a mission is assigned to the astronaut. Please make a selection.